11-year-old boy named Emil Wamuno sets off a series of events that led to the deaths of 11,316 people. That sounds crazy, right? How can a two-year-old do that? Let me explain. So let's go back to December 2013. In a small remote village in the southeastern parts of the country of Guinea, that's where Emil and his family lived. One day, Emil was playing in a tree, not unlike the children you see playing in the tree in this picture. There were bats that lived in that tree, and later on, Emil got sick. Four days after Emil got sick, he died. Within a short time after that, Emil's grandmother, his mother, and his three-year-old sister also died. Now, they all had the same symptoms, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, but nobody knew what was causing it. It wasn't until March of the following year, 2014, that the Ebola virus was identified as the cause of those deaths. And by then, it had spread. It was in eight communities across the country of Guinea, and there were reported cases in the neighboring countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone. Within months of Emil's death, Ebola had spread globally. It came to us here in Nigeria. It ended up in Spain, Italy, Mali, the UK, Senegal, the US. It was everywhere. It was by far the largest Ebola outbreak ever recorded in history. Altogether, there were 28,639 reported cases, 11,316 deaths, including two-year-old Emil and his family. So what happened when Ebola came to Nigeria? Let me recap the story. Patrick Sawyer, a Liberian diplomat, he left Monrovia in Liberia and he flew to Lagos in Nigeria. Twelve days before he traveled, his sister died from Ebola, and he had been the one taking care of her, so he had been exposed. By the time he landed in Lagos at the airport, he was so sick that he collapsed. So because he was a diplomat, under normal circumstances, he should have been taken to a designated government hospital. But at the time, all the government hospitals were on strike. So he was taken to this hospital, a private facility. Keep in mind, up until this point, Ebola had never been in Nigeria before. So Patrick Sawyer goes to this hospital. He gets there, and he seems to have symptoms that look like malaria. They question him, they examine him, they do a test. And the test comes back positive for malaria. So they start treatment for that. And nobody suspected anything else. So that was on a Sunday. Monday morning, the next day, Dr. Ameo Adadovo showed up at the hospital. She was the senior consultant at that hospital. And when she was doing her usual Monday morning ward round, she came across Patrick Sawyer. As soon as she saw him, she felt that something was wrong. She just, she didn't think it was malaria. She suspected it was Ebola, even though she had actually never seen Ebola before. And even though he was denying having contact with anyone that had Ebola, she had a suspicion. So at this point, what happens? Like I said, Ebola had never been in Nigeria before, so we were not prepared. We didn't know what to do. She called the Ministry of Health, got everybody alerted that, you know, suspected case, what do we do, what do we do? Everyone's panicking, the usual. So together, she, her team, and the government started putting together a plan. How do we handle this thing? But the first step was to get a test done, because right now, it was just a suspicion. She just thought the guy had Ebola. It had to be confirmed. So they had to take a sample of his blood and send it off for testing. Now, at the time, those kind of tests took a few days. So in the meantime, while they were waiting for the results of the test, Patrick Sawyer wanted to leave the hospital. He came to Lagos to attend a conference to represent his country at ECOWAS. So he was demanding to be released to go and attend the conference, and she refused. When she refused, the Liberian government got involved. The Liberian ambassador called Dr. Dadevo and told her that she was going to be sued for kidnapping. <laughs> Why kidnapping? Well, he said that she didn't have any confirmed diagnosis, that she was holding the man against his will and therefore kidnapping him. So they were threatening to prosecute her. Despite that pressure, despite the man's agitation to leave, she refused. He was barricaded inside the room where they had kept him, so he couldn't get out. Subsequently, the test results came back, positive for Ebola. 
Suspicion is now confirmed. But before anything else could happen, the man died. So from that Patrick Sawyer, 19 other people in Nigeria got Ebola. 11 of them survived, and eight of them died, including Dr. Dadovo and three of her colleagues at this hospital. Dr. Dadovo said her exact words were that for the greater public good, she would not release that man. Now, we know that Nigeria is the most populous country on the African continent, right? We have 180, 190 million people, possibly more. And in addition to that, we have a high degree of travel in this country. Thousands of Nigerians leave every day and travel to different parts of the world. So we can only imagine what would have happened if he had left this hospital, walked out into the Obalende community where the hospital is located, gone to that conference where other West African leaders were coming to represent their countries the whole world would have been in trouble. And we'd be having a very different conversation right now. But that didn't happen. So this story I'm telling you um, is not just a story for me, because Dr. Dadova was my aunt. And when Ebola was in West Africa, when it was in the three most affected countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. I was working for a global health organization at the time. And we had projects, we had staff, we had offices in those three countries. So even before the whole world was paying attention to Ebola, I was working with a company that was responding and working on it, because that's where we were. But I never imagined that this thing that I'm doing for work would have any effect on my personal life. I never imagined that Ebola would literally come to my doorstep the way it did. Um, my aunt was an amazing woman, and I'm not just saying that because we are related, but she really was, and she was a fantastic physician. She had a very unique ability to diagnose infectious diseases, even though she had no formal training in that area. Um, a lot of people don't know, but she, Two years before Ebola, in 2012, she also diagnosed the first case of swine flu in Nigeria, again, preventing an outbreak. And two years later, did it again with Ebola um, and lost her life in the process. So um, I say all that to just give you some background as to who she was. But more importantly, she was a patriot. That's the best word I can use to describe her throughout her life, despite what she did in the medical field. As a human being, that's who she was. She loved Nigeria, loved this country too much. And that's why she said what she said, that for the greater public good, she would not release that man. So we're now in 2017. Ebola is gone. 19 people were affected, and eight died, including my aunt and her team. Are we ready for another Ebola? That's the question. If Ebola comes back today, are we OK? Are we safe? What can we do? We need to train our health workers. I mentioned earlier that my aunt had a unique ability to diagnose infectious diseases, even though that wasn't her area of specialty in medicine. It shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be that that's a unique or uncommon thing. It should be that everybody in the health sector can recognize these diseases, even if they've never seen it before, because that's how these things are now contained. If you miss the initial diagnosis, like what happened with Emil, it was three months after he died that people realized that, oh, that thing was actually Ebola. It's too late. So we need to invest in our health workers, people in the health sector. They need to be trained on how to recognize and diagnose properly, how to isolate and quarantine, who to call, who, what authorities do you call, where do you send the sample to get confirmation. All of these things are not things that are being taught in the basic medical or nursing education that we have here today. So there's a knowledge gap that needs to be addressed. A concrete example of that is that when Ebola came to Nigeria, like I said, we weren't prepared. We did not have one single doctor. Of all the brilliant doctors we have in this country, not one of them was trained on how to respond to Ebola. So we had to rely on an American. This man flew in from Washington, D.C. to Lagos to treat the first few cases we had, including my aunts. And he was an American, nothing to do with Nigeria. But he came to um, dedicate his time now, subsequently, when that American taught and trained Nigerian doctors, they were able to do the same thing. So there is a solution. We just need to focus on that education and training piece. So that works for people who are in the health sector and operating. But what about those of us sitting here today? We're not all doctors and nurses, I'm sure. So what can we do to keep ourselves safe from whatever outbreak comes next? Already in 2017, we've had a lot of outbreaks in this country. You may or may not know. 
some small and some big. We've had meningitis, Lassa fever, cholera, measles, and the most recent is monkeypox, which hasn't been in Nigeria since the 1970s, but is suddenly making a comeback. So it's clear that infectious diseases are not going away. They're going to, old ones are going to come back and new ones are going to come up. So what can we do to keep ourselves safe? We all live in communities, right? We all have families, friends, loved ones, you know, neighbors, colleagues, people that we care about and love. So what can we do on our, in, a, on our, in our daily lives to protect ourselves and the people around us? The first step is to recognize the power that we have. It's very important for everybody here to understand that as an individual, you have the ability to change the course of history. That might sound a little bit cliche, but what I'm trying to say is look at Emil, an innocent two-year-old boy who went to play in a tree. Next thing you know, 11,315 people are dead, including himself and the people that he loved around him. Then you have someone like my aunt, what she did. We don't know how many lives she saved, but it's a lot, right? So as an individual, you have that power and responsibility. So let me give a concrete example. During the time of Ebola in Nigeria, everybody was using hand sanitizer. It was everywhere. We couldn't enter a bank, an office, a school. Anywhere you want to go, you first have to clean your hands, right? Everybody can remember that. Um, it was to the point that hand sanitizer was expensive, and we couldn't find it. And so people were now you know, locally manufacturing hand sanitizer. Some people were making fake sanitizer, but you know, that's another story. The point is people understood their role and their personal responsibility and the impact they could have on the society and the communities in which they lived. Imagine if you go to the bank and everybody cleans their hands to enter the bank, but one person doesn't. And that one person who doesn't has been exposed to some infectious disease. It doesn't even have to be Ebola. Let's say they go to the counter to fill their deposit slip and they use a pen that's around and they fill it and they drop it. Then somebody else comes and takes that pen and fills their own and drops it. And somebody else comes and does the same thing. By the time you've done that, it's already an outbreak. So at the time when Ebola was in our face, when we had that fear because it was in our country and we didn't know what was going to happen, we understood that the power of infectious diseases and how we as individuals could stop them. But now it's all gone. You go to the bank, you go to the shops, you go outside, you don't see hand sanitizer anymore. That's the issue. We've lowered our sense of urgency. We think because Ebola is not here, we're fine. That's not the case. Another thing is self-medication. We tend to feel like, okay, I have a fever, it's malaria. Let me go to my pharmacy or a local drug seller, get drugs, take them, and I'll be fine. Again, that's wrong. You don't know what that fever is. Fever is just your body's way of telling you that there's something in your system that should not be there. The fever itself does not tell you what that thing is. You now have to go and get tested. When you get tested, they'll tell you what it is, give you the correct treatment, so that you cannot just recover fully, but so that you don't spread whatever it is that's in your system to everyone around you. So let's imagine for a minute if Emil, when he was sick, if his mother had taken him to a health facility where the doctors were trained, like I spoke about earlier, where they were trained to recognize something they may have not seen before, what could have happened? Let's imagine what could have happened if in Emil's village where he lived, they had hand sanitizer and they understood how germs spread and they were practicing good hygiene and health behaviors. We don't know for sure, but it's very possible that the chain of transmission of the Ebola virus could have been broken right there in that village, instead of spreading across the world and killing thousands of people. So I say all of that just to remind us that infectious diseases are invisible. You can't see them. You don't know if the person sitting next to you or behind you right now has something. You will never know. So, <laughs> not to scare you, but it's the truth. <laughs> you, you, you won't know. So, and the other thing is not only are they invisible, but they easily move around. They cross borders easily. We've seen it. Whether you're living in a remote village in the southeastern parts of Guinea, or whether you live in Italy or the States or Mali or here in Nigeria, we all face the same risk because these things move. And not only do they move, but they don't respect any societal or you know, borders that we create as, as human beings. So whether you're rich and you live in a mansion or whether you live on the streets, it doesn't matter. Infectious diseases don't discriminate. They don't. <laughs> They're open for all. So 
I just encourage us to remember Emile's story, remember what my aunt did, and remember the power that you have to change history. So my question for you today is what are you doing for the greater public good? Thank you.